Good neighbours all, and my very good friends, I bid ye a hearty good day. For I've come from the wave beat chalk stacks, out yonder to west of Pool Bay, to join in this wonderful pageant, and to tell ye what you want to see, and hear about fair lovely Pola, or queen of this coast she be. So sit yourselves down, and tend to our show, while the story of Polo we trace through all the long years of her history to this present year of grace. With those words, the voice of old Harry launched the pageant of Paul in 1950. Since then, much has changed, and the somewhat run-down little port and town of Paul has been transformed into a modern, dynamic community which is more than ready to face the new millennium. The story of Paul really began before Old Harry existed, when the first Stone Age men moved into Dorset, and Britain was still joined to Europe long before the sea broke through the chalk cliffs and the land sank to form the English Channel. The first inhabitants were nomadic people who lived in the woods and forests along the Star Valley. The landscape in those days would have been similar to the view here at Corf Hills looking across the valley. The nomads brought skills for making flint tools, spinning, weaving and pottery. They fed themselves by gathering roots and nuts, and by hunting birds. Bears and wolves also roamed the area. Over time, they gradually settled down, at first along the Star Valley, and also around Pool Harbour. These early men lived in small settlements, and were here through the Bronze and Iron Ages. They built farms and cleared the land, creating the distinctive Dorset Heathland habitat. High on Broadstone Golf Course, there is a Bronze Age barrow, and around Pool there have been many important finds of tools and other items. As they became established, the early settlers moved down the rivers and began to explore the harbour channels, travelling around in boats carved from huge logs. The Pool Log Boat has given us our first glimpse of the life of early mariners. In 1964, local divers found a massive Iron Age boat, almost completely intact, in the mud of Pool Harbour. Today, after many experiments and a 10-year stay in a special tank at Scaffords Court, the boat has been moved here to Hatch Pond. It is now preserved in a special sugar solution, where it will remain until the delicate timber is stabilised sufficiently for the boat to be removed. Over time, huge encampments were built at Maiden Castle, Badbury Rings and Hod Hill near Blandford Forum. Iron Age men became involved in making pottery, which flourished because the rich clay deposits to be found in the area. This link has continued on through the centuries with pots, clay pipes, tiles and of course the world famous pool pottery. The early potters used only the colour of the flame and their experience to determine how long each batch of pottery should be fired. The results they achieved were remarkably good, with many examples found in the pool area. In 
In AD 43, the Roman Second Legion invaded, led by the mighty general Vespasian, who went on to become the Roman Emperor. They stormed the hill forts of Maiden Castle, Hod Hill, Badbury, and many other encampments, and within a short period controlled the area, a domination that was to continue for nearly 400 years. The Romans introduced farms and systems of law and order and brought with them many arts, crafts and skills that were to help develop the civilised world. They also built a port at Hamworthy and from it a road through to a fortress at Lake and on to Badbury Rings and Old Serum. The fortress at Lake was the first military base in the pool area which even to this day maintains its military links with the Royal Marine Commandos base at Hamworthy, where soldiers of a very different kind are trained. The Saxons would have used their own version of commandos to finally displace the Romano-British administration that had been left behind after the legions had been withdrawn to support the defence of Rome and her provinces. Thus by 660 AD, the West Saxon Kingdom had become established. The Saxons set up large estates and settlements, developed agriculture and crafts and put down the rudiments of legal and social structures. Many places we recognise today bear names from their Saxon origins. Wareham, Sanford, Upton, Sturt and of course Hole. The pool would have been used as a base for fishing and a place for ships to anchor on their way to Wareham, which was an important fortified stronghold of the West Saxon Kingdom. During this time, the new Christian faith was spreading and beginning to replace many of the old pagan ways. St. Aldham became the first bishop for the Dorset region. Leaving from Wareham in 700 AD, he was one of the first pilgrims to set out for Rome. Wareham was frequently the target of marauding Danes who burned the town on several occasions. In 876, Alfred the Great trapped a Danish fleet at Arne and drove them out past the pool in a great sea battle. A raging storm finally wrecked 120 ships on the shore at Studland. Over several centuries, the fortunes of the Danes and Saxons ebbed and flowed until 1015 when King Canute prevailed and occupied Brownsea Island, where he stored loot taken from the plundered churches and monasteries in Wessex. By the time of the Norman invasion in 1066, a large manor was established at Canford Magna, it was one of many estates confiscated from Saxon owners and passed to Norman sympathisers who had supported the invasion. The Normans were great builders in stone and replaced many Saxon timber structures. They built castles and churches, with examples of their work visible at Studland, Worth, Christchurch, Wimborne and of course Canford Magna. By 1200, William Longspey was Lord of the Manor and was regularly visited by his half-brother, King John, who came to hunt red deer on the Camford estate. Longspey died in 1226, and his tomb lies in Salisbury Cathedral, which he and his wife, the Lady Ela, had been instrumental in building. It represents the finest example of early English architecture that can be seen anywhere. The Camford Magna estate passed to his son, William Longspey II, who, like his father, wanted to go on the Crusades. But there was a problem, money. In order to raise funds for the Seventh Crusade, 
Longspey leased out Canford and other manors and also arranged for the sale of a charter of liberties to the burgesses of La Pole, or Pool, which was now a significant community on the southern shores of the Canford estate. This proved to be a turning point for Poole because the Longspey Charter, the 1248, granted a small measure of freedom from feudal rule by the Lord of the Manor. This permitted the people of Poole to elect six burgesses to form a borough council, with the Lord of the Manor retaining the right to choose a leader, or Port Reeve, from among the six. The Charter also provided for courts to be held in Poole itself, and for tolls to be collected on behalf of the Lord of the Manor from each ship leaving port. As for William Longsway II, he perished a year later in an ill-advised attack on the Saracens near Masura in Egypt. Although he lies buried in France, there is a monument to him not far from his father's tomb in Salisbury Cathedral. Over the next hundred years or so, Poole gradually gained more autonomy. Further recognition of its status was given in 1371, when William Montacute granted Poole a new charter confirming the Longspey Charter and naming the head officer Mayor instead of Port Reeve. The ancient rights bestowed by Longspey and Montacute are upheld each May with the annual mayor-making ceremony held here in the council chamber of the Civic Centre at Poole. The outgoing mayor and civic party attend a full council meeting to elect a new mayor for the next year. Following time-honoured traditions, the new mayor, deputy mayor and sheriff are elected, each having well-defined responsibilities for their period of office. Oh yay! Oh yay! Oh yay! Does any person here offer himself for the office of mayor of this borough for the ensuing year? The mayor, in addition to his normal duties, carries the honorary titles of mayor of the staple, clerk of the market, and admiral of the port of Port. One of his duties as admiral is to uphold the sea boundaries of the port in a ceremony which has its roots in the Winchelsea Certificate of 1364, which formally recognised the sea boundaries of the borough and gave Port the same rights of jurisdiction at sea as the sink ports. All such things that shall be given me in charge Today, the ceremony is only held every few years and reenacts the marking of the sea boundaries of Poole Harbour in a very light-hearted way. The Admiral of the Port and his jury proceed around the harbour in the Admiral's barge and at each limit carry out the ceremony of beating and pricking of a young boy and girl. This ritual goes back to an earlier time when a mayor, whilst marking the boundaries, caught some unruly boys on the way and beat them so that they would never forget the importance of the harbour boundaries. In later years, girls were included and their hands were pricked so that they would not forget their heritage. Traditionally, the Admiral is attacked by pirates, 
were repelled and their leader captured and hung, providing a spectacle for locals and visitors alike. The importance of the sea was reflected in the constant demands from the king to provide ships and mariners to support the many wars in which Britain became involved. In 1347, Paul sent four ships and nearly 100 men to the siege of Calais, which was key to the conquest of France. All the trading between Britain and Europe brought many benefits to Paul. However, it also meant that disease could spread more easily. And in 1348, the town was hit by bubonic plague, or Black Death as it was known. Thought to have arrived at Malcolm Regis with rats from France, the plague quickly swept through Weymouth and onto Poole, killing a third of the total population. The people of Poole who died were buried in a graveyard here at Beta, chosen for its isolation and accessed only by a narrow causeway from the town. Much later, during the Napoleonic Wars, Beta was used to site a hospital and gunpowder store. By the beginning of the 15th century, Paul was becoming a popular port of embarkation for pilgrims on their way to the shrine of St. James in Santiago. The aggravation between England, France and Spain carried on into the 15th century with raids on coastal towns a permanent hazard. The man who led the English reprisals was one Harry Pay, part privateer, part pirate. Harry led raids from Normandy right through to the Bay of Biscay and Finisterre. So angry were the Spanish and French that they sent a large fleet to attack Paul, which was unfortified. After a fierce battle, the gallant men of Paul drove back the raiders using thick doors as shields. Just imagine what it would have been like standing here in Ball Lane. The French and Spanish attackers would have been well armed, but these alleyways are so narrow that men armed with pikes and staves behind heavy timbers would have had the advantage over the attackers and would have been able to block their progress almost indefinitely. However, in spite of this valiant defense, the church and town cellars were burnt. In those days, the town cellar was called the King's Wool House and was a store for wool and hides. It stretched across the road and joined with what is now part of the King Charles public house. As well as ransacking the town, the raiders were looking for Harry Pay, who was long gone. They did, however, find his unfortunate brother, whom they killed before setting fire to the town and leaving. Two years later, as revenge, Harry Pay captured 120 French vessels laden with iron, salt and lead and brought them triumphantly back as a gift for the valiant men of Paul. During this time and for the next century, the Lords of Canford Manor supported the reigning monarch, which was not surprising because most of them were related to him in some way. They also allowed more freedom in the day-to-day -day running of the port. The medieval Canford Manor had been built and the kitchen wing known as John O'Gaunt's Kitchen still stands today as a fine example of the period. In 1433, King Henry issued letters patent, elevating Paul to the rank of Port of the Staple. This placed Paul in an elite group of ports which were allowed to export staple goods like wool and hides that all attracted customs revenue and which were being produced from the growing number of sheep farms in the area. The grant of 1433 also authorised the fortification of the town. Sadly, no trace of these defences remain today. Some buildings of the same period that have survived are the almshouses of the Fraternity of St George here in Church Street. Built before 1429, they were for members of the Fraternity in need of accommodation and food. Today the building still provides sheltered accommodation and are the oldest continuously occupied domestic buildings in Poole. Twenty years after Poole became a port of the staple, 
the Hundred Years' War with France ended and the export trade with Europe then flourished. Striking evidence of this trade was found in 1984 when a local fisherman caught his nets on an underwater obstruction. As there were no known wrecks in the area, he caught in the hand with his sub aqua club, who dived on the site and quickly confirmed that it was a very old wreck sticking up out of the seabed. Experts were called in from Paul Museum and the National Maritime Museum and further dives organised. Samples of Spanish pottery and other cargo were recovered and soon it was apparent that the site was of major importance. What the divers had discovered was the remains of a Spanish merchant ship, older than the Mary Rose and which had sunk whilst trying to shelter from a storm. This site has been extensively surveyed and details of the ship's construction and the nature of the cargo established. Another source of trade as special to Poole was with the Channel Islands. The wily merchants of Poole had realised that in times of war and strife, when direct trade with the continent was prohibited, the Channel Islands provided a gateway to and from the markets of Europe. By the late 1400s, there would have been a large number of stone houses along the quay at Poole. The only one to have survived is this old town house now known as Captain's Court. It is possible that King Henry VII visited here and that the building was the first town hall in Poole. Later it was converted into the George Inn and by the 20th century had become tenements that had fallen into a bad state of repair. A severe storm in 1923 caused damage that revealed the medieval structure. After many setbacks, the historian H.B. Smith, together with former Mayor Charles Carter and the Society of Poor Men, managed to raise enough funds to begin the work of restoration. Today, the building represents one of the finest examples of a medieval townhouse in the country. All through the 15th and 16th centuries, overseas trade and shipbuilding at Poole flourished. In 1989, important evidence of this was found when an old foundry site, which was being excavated, revealed the remains of a shipyard and examples of beautifully preserved timbers made for a medieval ship. The reputation of the shipbuilders of Poole must have been very high because in 1512, Henry VIII commandeered local shipwrights to build a ship for him. At about the same time, he also gave St. James's Church freedom from Canford Manor, thus establishing the parish church in its own right. A few years before all this happened, a discovery was made across the Atlantic, which unbeknown to the men of Paul, would transform the fortunes of the people and the town for several hundred years to come. It was the discovery of Newfoundland by one John Cabot, in 1497. His original goal was to discover a western route to Asia. He had been granted letters patent by King Henry VII to search for unknown lands and bring back merchandise to Bristol. What Cabot found in June 1497 was not only a newfound land but also one of the largest fishing grounds ever discovered by man. The seas were teeming with cod, so much so that the passage of his ships was impeded. The news of the abundant stocks soon tempted the more adventurous mariners of Ball, and by 1528 records show that large quantities of salt, an essential ingredient for the salt fish trade, was being landed at Paul. Over the next 50 years, the trade with Newfoundland steadily grew to meet the demand for fish from the Catholic countries of Europe. As a result of this expansion, Queen Elizabeth I granted Paul its most significant royal charter in 1568. The Queen Elizabeth I charter was important 
because it freed Poole from interference from Dorset and further reduced the powers of the Lord of the Manor. The Charter gave Poole the status of County of the Town of Poole uh, and the right to appoint its own sheriff, uh, hold courts and markets and to allow the Burgesses to appoint a mayor. The new status meant that the town had to be improved and a new town hall was built in Fish Street together with a market house and a prison. In 1583, there were 20 British ships in St John's Harbour, Newfoundland, when Sir Humphrey Gilbert claimed Newfoundland as England's first colony. And it is likely that amongst those present, there would have been seamen from Paul. At that time, all the vessels ran a serious risk of attack from the large number of privateers and foreign ships. However, the mariners of Paul persevered and braved not only pirates, but the ice and the fog and the mountainous seas that they encountered on the journey to and from Newfoundland. Whilst the fishing trade was quietly expanding elsewhere, wider issues were coming to a head as Britain was caught up in the Civil War. Paul was staunchly Puritan and parliamentarian and under constant threat of royalist attack. Wimborne had declared for the king so had the Banks family in nearby Corfe Castle. In the summer of 1643, a 600-strong parliamentarian army set out from Poole and for six weeks laid siege to the castle. successful and withdrew to help slow the royalist advance from the newly captured town of Dorchester. This too failed and before long the king had control of all Dorset except Paul and Lyme Regis. In a desperate attempt to seize the town the royalists devised a cunning plot. They thought they had discovered a disgruntled parliamentarian captain named Francis Sydenham. Captain Thomas Phillips billeted in royalist Wimborne secretly approached him. In return for £40 and various other incentives, Phillips asked Francis Sydenham to leave the town gate open one night so that the Royalist army could infiltrate and take over the town. Sydenham informed Colonel Bingham, Governor of Poole, and pretended to go along with the plot. At 2am on the agreed night, the Royalist troops under the command of Earl of Crawford were given the all clear by Sydenham. The Royalists walked straight into a trap and were fired upon from the concealed pool troops. In the ensuing battle, the slaughter would have been great had not many of the large guns been mounted too high to be fully effective. Nevertheless, the attackers were routed with heavy loss and the plotters captured. Lord Crawford narrowly avoiding capture. The offenders were brought to court, tried and subjected to immediate execution. Within three years of the pool plot, the fortunes of the King's army had completely reversed and by early 1645 only Portland and Corfe Castle held out for the King and the men of Poole laid siege once again to Corfe Castle. This time everyone realised the cause was lost and in February 1646 a small number of troops infiltrated and took possession of part of the castle. Realising that a full-scale attack was about to be launched by Colonel Bingham's force from Paul, the Royalists surrendered. The following month, Parliament voted that Corfe Castle should be raised to the ground and left unfit for defence. The result is the remains we see today, which is still one of the most spectacular sights on the Dorset landscape. From the late 1600s until about 1815, Paul enjoyed a period of unprecedented prosperity. The recognition of Newfoundland as British territory made possible the development of the cod fisheries and the associated Newfoundland trade. 
The evidence of this prosperity is in the magnificent Georgian houses and public buildings that we can see to this present day. The merchants of Paul founded whole dynasties which through intermarriage and alliance formed an elite group that became known as the Merchant Princes of Paul. By 1802, there were 350 ships in the Paul fleet. Between 1805 and 1815, the two great battles of the Napoleonic War, this was an extremely profitable time for the merchant princes. During that time, the price of 100 weight of salt cod rose from 10 shillings to 40 shillings a hundred weight. Not all the families were involved with the Newfoundland trade. Some like the Thompson and Jolliffe families were involved in trade with the Carolinas and the West Indies. Members of both these great families distinguished themselves in the service of Paul with daring clashes with privateers and were presented with medals to commemorate the bravery. Running alongside successful commerce and maritime adventure, there was a darker side to Paul, smuggling. The harbour and the chines leading out from nearby beaches were ideal for running contraband. In one notable incident, Paul was involved with the notorious Hawksworth gang, who terrorised the south coast and carried out a daring raid on the Paul Customs House to recover goods seized by customs officers. The gang smashed down the door and made off with the booty. Later, they killed a customs officer and another man who had informed on them. Most of the gang were eventually caught, tried and hanged. Although smuggling and the seamier side of maritime life was never far away, the spiritual side of things was also well represented, both in the parish church of St. James and here in the United Reformed Church of Skinner Street the oldest church still standing in Poole. It was here in Poole, in the nearby parish church of St James, that the legendary parish clerk William Nat worked. He became famous as a composer of hymn tunes, notably Wareham, and the Christmas carol, while shepherds watched their flocks by night. The final defeat of Napoleon in 1815 was a major event that changed the fortunes of the Paul merchants. The trade with Newfoundland had flourished all through the Napoleonic Wars because Portugal, Italy and Spain relied upon the supplies of dried fish provided by the Paul merchants. Peace meant that the French and the Americans could now fish the waters and take over many of the services provided by Paul. The result was a rapid decline. Within a few years, many of the merchants had ceased trading or faced complete ruin. Some of the merchants did not at first recognize that the business was declining and thought that the slump was only temporary. Christopher Spurrier, who was the young head of the great Spurrier empire, was more concerned with an enjoying an extravagant lifestyle in the fashionable resorts of Ryde and Weymouth, rather than having any concerns about the declining trade. In 1814, he married Amy Garland, the most eligible young woman in Paul, and pressed on with building this magnificent mansion at Upton for his new wife. No expense was spared, and the house with sweeping views over Paul Harbour was completed in 1816. Thank you. 
By 1819, the slump in trade was at its worst. Nevertheless, it did not prevent the people of Paul from rebuilding the parish church of St James at great expense to the town. The old church was so dilapidated that it was decided to completely rebuild it. One feature was the magnificent pillars fashioned appropriately from Newfoundland pine. By 1825, the Newfoundland trade was all but finished. With many firms bankrupt, the leading house of Jolliffe, Spurrier and Jolliffe had somehow survived, and Christopher Spurrier was still leading the high life. But his money was running out, and in 1828, Spurrier was forced to sell Upton House. Two years later, after a disastrous fishing season, the family firm finally went bankrupt, with debts of £26,000 an enormous sum in those days. One remarkable man was John Bingley Garland, who had been mayor of Poole in 1824, and went on to become the first speaker in the Newfoundland House of Assembly in 1832. Isaac Lester's house here at Post Green near Poole was the model for which the Garland House in Trinity evolved, and was the first brick-built house in Newfoundland. By the 1960s, the house in Trinity had fallen into disrepair and was to be demolished. Its importance was then realised and in 1990, the Trinity Trust was formed to raise funds on both sides of the Atlantic to rebuild the property. After enormous efforts by Dr Alan Perry and the Trinity Trust, the money was raised and the rebuilt house opened on the 25th of June 1997. This coincided with the celebrations marking the 500th anniversary of John Cabot landing in Newfoundland. In spite of the disasters of the early 1800s, improvements to the town continued. And in 1830, William Ponsonby, MP for Paul, and Benjamin Lester Lester gave Paul a subscription library. The building is now used by Paul Museums and is visited annually by thousands of visitors. This end of the High Street is also the site of the Antelope Hotel. From here at the nearby Angel Inn, stagecoaches set out daily for London, Weymouth and Southampton, with a coach to Salisbury leaving three times a week. There are also numerous carriers operating out of the port. One common sight would have been the dog cart, hauled by up to three huge Newfoundland dogs these carts were used for local deliveries and in relays for the fast delivery of fish and perishable goods, occasionally as far as London, a practice fortunately made illegal in 1850. Another innovation by William Ponsonby was the building of the first bridge from Poole to Hamworthy in 1834. Because Poole Corporation was virtually bankrupt at the time, Ponsonby promoted his own Act of Parliament to build a wooden toll bridge. The bridge had a very steep gradient that caused great problems for horses. It was replaced in 1885 by an iron construction with much easier gradients. It was also privately owned and collected tolls until 1926 when it was purchased by Paul Council. The following year, amid great pomp and ceremony, the present bridge was open.
1990s, history is repeating itself as Paul Borough Council reveals plans to try and build a new super bridge across the bay. As in 1834, the problem is finding the cash. Until 1835, Paul was governed by a borough corporation, controlled by local gentry and heavily influenced by the Lord of Canford Manor, who was the largest local landowner. This system had, by and large, looked after the interests of the community well, but times were changing and nationally a mood of reform was in the air. William Ponsonby, the current Lord of Canford Manor, was a Whig and an ardent reformer. Unfortunately, some of the local gentry were Tory and opposed to reform and reacted bitterly in 1835 when the Municipal Corporations Act was passed. There followed 16 years of claim, counterclaim and ruinous litigation that all but stopped normal corporation business. A Mr Parr, the last town clerk of the old corporation and a staunch Tory put in huge claims for loss of office. The new council had no funds to pay him and were so short of cash that the new gas lighting installed in 1838 had to be turned off through lack of cash. In 1839, the Guildhall, its furniture and the borough's ancient seals, two great maces of office and the silver ore of the water bailiff were seized by the court and given to Mr Parr in lieu of cash. The courts eventually awarded Mr Parr a substantial sum which the council could only pay by selling St James Rectory and raising a loan. Fortunately, over time, the council has recovered or been kindly bequeathed most of the items seized by the court. Despite the troubles of the town, trade did continue, albeit in a steady decline during the mid-1800s. And although transport by road was well developed, most bulk goods travelled by sea. There were regular routes to the Port of London, Portsmouth, Southampton and the Channel Islands. Incoming ships brought coal from Newcastle and timber from Scandinavia. Nevertheless, the town was in need of a boost. So in 1847, when the first Poole railway station was opened on the Hamworthy side of Poole Bridge, it was hoped that the economy would gradually pick up. Unfortunately, the reverse happened. The railway effectively killed off the coastal shipping trade carried out from Poole. Within five years, the fleet of ships had fallen from over 60 to practically nothing. The situation was further aggravated when in 1872 a railway line was opened from Broadstone Junction bringing the railway right to the centre of Poole and sealing the fate of coastal shipping for good. Two years later the line was extended across Parkstone Bay and through to the newly emerging town of Bournemouth. There was also a benefit from this final extension to the railway. When passing across Parkston Bay, the causeway formed a magnificent saltwater lake. This became the centrepiece of a large park formed from land donated by Lord Wimborne along with adjoining acreage purchased by the council. Pool Park was officially opened by Edward, Prince of Wales on 18th of January 1890 and has been a source of great pleasure to thousands of residents and visitors alike. Another advantage brought by the railway was the link to Bournemouth, which had expanded from a population of 650 in 1851 to 17,000 in 1881, against a population of 12,000 in Poole at the same time. This meant that the Port of Poole had a boost in porting timber and building materials to support the building work in Bournemouth and the developing areas of Longfleet and Parkstone. Local potteries in Brangson, Parkstone and Kinson developed the production of pipes and bricks and also distinctive terracotta fittings which were incorporated into many buildings of the period. Red floor tiles were also needed and in 1873 one Jesse Carter acquired an ailing floor tile company which was to become the springboard for one of Poole's best known companies, the Poole Pottery. 
Within 10 years, the range of tiles had been expanded to include glazed, modelled and hand-painted war tiles. So by 1905, there was a small thriving pottery unit making vases, bowls, dishes and some animal figures. The rest, as they now say, is history. There being produced from here a whole string of creative works from a number of distinguished potters and artists whose work is sought after by collectors all over the world. The late 1800s also saw the growth of larger shops in Port High Street. Some of which are still in business today, and many, sadly, which are not. There was also thriving breweries and foundry works. In 1907, Robert Baden-Powell, a hero from the Boer War, chose Brownsea Island to hold an experimental camp for a small group of boys from the local community. The event was a success. Baden-Powell went on to complete his book, Scouting for Boys. This inspired many youngsters to form their own troops, and so the scouting movement was born. Subsequently, it grew into an organisation that for over 90 years has enhanced the lives of millions of boys and girls throughout the world. In 1885, the first pool lifeboat station was established. The Harmer lifeboat operated between 1910 and 1939 and was frequently seen on training exercises in the harbour. In 1975, the Royal National Lifeboat Institute moved their headquarters to Poole, where they have now become firmly established. The dawn of the 20th century saw another major development for the town with the advent of a tram service from Poole to Westbourne in 1900. The blue and white tram cars operated until 1905 when the service was bought by Poole Corporation who extended the link to Bournemouth and operated the service until 1935. The 1930s were a time of worldwide depression and Paul did not escape. One project designed to ease the high unemployment was the construction of a new municipal building in 1932, with frescoes depicting important moments in the history of the town. The Second World War was not far away and the people of Paul were drawn into the conflict with the rest of the nation. The first bomb to fall on Paul was here in Upper Parkstone, outside this rank of shops. One of the shopkeepers was a Mr Shepherd, a keen cinematographer, who recorded the damage to his shop and also his family preparing for war. Paul Harbour was thought to be a prime area for invasion and was heavily fortified. As well as serving in the armed forces, the people of Poole enthusiastically joined up as air raid wardens and members of the Home Guard. 
When peace was in sight, VOAC returned with a flying boat service that was to serve many parts of the world. Peace finally came in May 1945 and there were flags and bunting everywhere with celebrations and street parties. Paul Speedway opened and the fans flocked in and it was not unusual to have a crowd of seven or eight thousand at a typical meeting. The old town of Paul, however, was in a sorry state. Much of the housing had been condemned before the war. Now the process of reconstruction had to begin in earnest. One of the first projects was the construction of a new power station in 1949, which became a landmark on the local skyline with its massive twin chimneys. The power station's use, however, was short-lived and by the 1980s was only used on standby. It was finally demolished in 1995, watched by most of the town. As the town climbed out of the austerity of the war years, it became apparent that if Paul was to recover, radical action would have to be taken. Housing, schools, roads and just about all the services needed to run a modern town were lacking, or sadly run down, not least here in the old town of Paul, which was in a sorry state. Many of the houses were derelict or unfit for occupation, some inhabited by vagrants or left to rot. Consequently, the people who were left gradually moved out. In 1960, despite pressures to demolish large areas of slum properties, a special precinct was created to preserve a 15-acre area which included some of the most notable buildings in the historic centre of Poole. From these plans, a policy of preservation was developed which over the next 10 years or so expanded into a full-scale rejuvenation of the town. Outside the old town, one of the first new buildings to be erected was Paul General Hospital, built as a replacement for the old Cornelia Hospital at Longfleet. It was fitted with all the latest in medical care and was a blueprint for the future. It was opened by Queen Elizabeth II on the 11th of July 1969. Through the 1960s and 1970s, the pace of change accelerated with an abundance of new projects. The largest of these was the plan to revitalise shopping in the town with a massive redevelopment. A huge area at the end of the high street through to the ladies walking field was cleared and a modern shopping centre built. It incorporated a sports centre, library and bus station. When it opened in 1969, the Arndale Centre was one of the first shopping complexes in the country to offer fully covered shopping in an air-conditioned environment. The new Tungate Bridge, built over the railway, was opened in 1972, which at a stroke improved access to the old town, the quay and the newly emerging Channel Ferry Dock on the Hamworthy side of the lifting bridge. There was also a parcel of land near the western end of the Tangate Bridge, which was suitable for development. Something prestigious was needed. By chance, Barclays Bank were looking for a new banking centre, and the pool site was ideal. So in 1976, Barclays Bank International opened operations in Pool, 
and their impressive building became a dominant feature of the local landscape. In 1978, Port Art Centre was opened with its own cinema, theatre and concert hall, which finally established a strong cultural dimension to the town. All through the 1980s and 90s, the town and port has grown. The development of the cross-channel ferries, shipping and industry have all contributed to the town's prosperity. Today, Paul has a strong identity no longer a little backwater of a coastal port, but a thriving town with a good industrial and commercial base and an ever-increasing importance as a holiday destination. Links with our nearer neighbours too are better than they have ever been. In 1998, the Paul Sherberg Twinning Association celebrated 21 years of partnership with civic events on both sides of the channel. The Mayor of Poole and the Mayor of Sherberg renewed the pledges of friendship and cooperation. Never before has the town been in such a stable and prosperous position. We can look back proudly on 2,000 years of history and over 750 years of government. The prospects in the 21st century for the people of Poole can only be positive. story now be finished. So I'll bid ye a very good day. And now that this pageant be ended, I'll wend my way back to Pool Bay, where I'll stand as of old Polar's guardian, keeping watch in faith as I must, till my old eyes grow dim with peering, and my figure do crumble to dust. <laughs> <laughs>